This was one army out of one nation, out of 48 states, out of many peoples and many colors and many religions. This was E Pluribus Unum, all right. We trusted in God and we trusted in each other. We trusted in each other because we needed each other. And when you looked around and saw the other guys, you knew that nobody could lick us. We were strong because we were free and equal, and we were together. That's what democracy means. That's what was on the penny. That's what we were fighting for. This was the Army of Liberation. And what an army. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. The war started for me on D-Day morning, June 6, 1944. I was a combat photographer on a boat crossing the English Channel. The Germans were very well dug in. Their pillboxes were really sunk into the side of the hills guns face the beach. We were among the first troops to hit the beach. Walter Rosenblum. He had been a photographer for the AAA, Agricultural Adjustment Administration of the Department of Agriculture. It was a New Deal agency. I was attached to an engineer battalion. Our job was to remove the pylons in the water that blocked our boats. As we got off, shells were falling all around. It was the first time I saw a dead Around me were dead Americans floating in the water. One of my first pictures was a young lieutenant swimming in all that mess, bringing back a couple of survivors. I was shooting film all through this with a 4x5 speed graph. The lieutenant in charge of our unit jumped into a foxhole and we didn't see him for three days. He got scared and hid. The rest of us carried on. I was with a movie photographer named Val Pope. He was great. It was scary because that afternoon the Germans came over and bombed the hell out of the beaches. Some of the landing barges are stopped by concrete obstacles built far out in the water by the enemy. Offshore, the larger landing craft approach the beachhead slowly. the shore. Out of enemy firing range, the LSTs wait to move in until the beaches are cleared. motorized equipment marks the end of the first phase of the landing. The LCIs, their first loads of men now on the beaches, go out to the transports to ferry more troops inshore. Elliot Johnson. I was on an LST, a landing ship tank. It was 300 feet long had a great mouth in front of which was the ramp that led down the smaller craft. 
I remember going up to the highest part of that ship and watching the panorama around me unfold. In my mind's eye, I see one of our ships take a direct hit and go up in a huge ball of flames. There were big geysers coming up where the shells were landing, and there were bodies floating face down, face up. The LST as we vacated it was to become a hospital ship. The boys who had gone first and been wounded were now being brought out. This continued my education, recognizing our body as finite. I remember one young boy who was so badly hurt he was gray, like a piece of flannel. I thought he was dead. They gave him a transfusion and I could see his color coming back. The relief I felt that this boy was going to make it. I can't remember whether he was German or ours. It didn't matter. Isn't that interesting? It came our turn to go into the little craft, and we went in. We had a young Navy officer who wasn't going to take us up that beach. I knew dang good and well that if we took our 155 off in that water, that would be all she wrote. We could swim ashore, but we'd never make it. We were loaded with so much paraphernalia. So I ended up taking my gun out on him, shoved it in his mouth. Can you believe that? He wanted to get the hell out of there. He was the guy in the cane mutiny, the one rattling the steel balls in his hand. He wanted to dump us. Yeah, that's close enough. Go on. He finally got us to where we were in about three feet of water, and he said, I just can't go anymore. Fine, let down the ramp. Still waiting beyond gun range, the LSTs unload supplies on smaller LCTs. Heavier equipment is transferred to giant rhino ferries, flat-bottomed barges that will land it ashore. And reinforcements arrive. Thousands of men. around and saw this causeway filling with water very fast. I would have locked us on the beach. I told Rackley to hit it. We made it to one area that was only under one foot of water. That became our road, and we got across off the beach. Part of my job was standing near the driver because we had a 50 caliber machine gun mounted up there that I would operate if necessary. We looked back, and there were the Germans. Beyond them were the Americans still on the beach side, so I was able to shoot at the backs of the Germans. We weren't the only ones that got across the water. There was an anti-aircraft crew. This was the dangest thing. You can't imagine all this noise and all these shells exploding, and fellas being hurt and killed. And here's this crew sitting, smoking cigarettes and reading a comic book. I couldn't believe it. We stopped a hundred feet from them. I could see them out of the corner of my eye. All of a sudden, wham! They were galvanized into action. I looked up and nobody had to say anything. All of us dove out of that thing and crawled under, because here came these three German aircraft. These guys didn't do any hiding. We did. It's a good thing we did. The Germans hit that thing with those 50 caliber machine guns, and these guys hit every one of those three German airplanes and knocked them down. Every one of them. Only two parachutes opened, and we were yelling and jumping up and down, where's the other parachute? Obviously, the boy was killed. We were rooting for him. Yeah, the German guy. Funny, huh? Now, way down the road, I saw on my right these dead German boys. On my left, going across the field, is a French peasant leading a cow, cradling its head in his arms, protecting it with his body as much as possible. He had come back to get his cow, leading it away from all the noise and death. I looked up. There was a two-story house across the road to the woods. I could see this German boy silhouetted in the window. I finished laying the guns and, with a couple of others, went around to the right flank. We had incendiary grenades and set the house on fire. Pretty soon the boy came out. He was my first prisoner. I told him, take your shoes off. He didn't understand, so I got down and pulled them off. He had thrown his gun away. All you do is point him back down the road. What happens to him, you could care less. He's out of the war. Everybody that sees him knows he's been captured, as long as he's in uniform and barefoot. On the way to the house, I'd come across a paratrooper sergeant, helplessly entangled in a tree. He had a broken leg, compound break, blood coming out of his pants. As soon as we sent the German boy down the road, we cut this boy down. He was so humiliated because he had been up there since before daybreak. I was very calm in laying my battery. We got our first order to fire. 
There is 6,400 degrees in an aiming circle. We were 90 degrees off. We'll never know where those shells came down. I just hope and pray I didn't hurt anybody who was out of the war. I hope it went into the ocean. This was the first day, all the first day. A lifetime in one day. In the course of this campaign for the final defeat of the enemy, you may sustain further loss and damage. Tragic though they may be, they are part of the price of victory. This landing is but the opening phase of the campaign in Western Europe. Great battles lie ahead. I call upon all who love freedom to stand with us now. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute. Together we shall achieve victory. Once again, the landing barges moved out into the channel. This time, loaded with German prisoners. In England, prisoners board a Coast Guard transport. And ships which have carried thousands of American soldiers overseas now return westward with a different cargo, with men who were beaten and captured in Normandy. Walter Rosenblum. Photographers were very privileged. We had a pass signed by General Eisenhower which said we could go anywhere we wanted and do anything we felt like. If an MP said you can't go into a restricted area, we'd just flash this pass. We broke through on the way to Cherbourg and captured Saint-Lô, where the Germans had holed up. A lot of the Germans we took prisoner were just kids in army uniforms. The bulk of the German army were probably done in at Stalingrad, and these, many of them, were just children. They'd been manning these pillboxes that were so hard to get in. They seemed terribly bewildered, lost, and frightened. They were 14, 15, 16. They looked terrible. They stood there crouched over, cold and miserable and unhappy, and not knowing what was going to happen to them. We got them, turned them in, and went about our business. Of course, I took photographs of them. There were two kinds of Germans we captured, these kids and the SS troops. The SS were impossible. They thought they had won the war even after we captured them. They were beyond belief. But the average German soldier was just a young man who was drafted. Dr. Alex Schulman. He's a surgeon practicing in Southern California. As a young army surgeon, he apparently kept meticulous records. I was impatient while in England, waiting to cross the channel. D-Day came and went, and other days went, and you start thinking, oh my God, the war's over. Anyway, on D-11, I landed in Normandy. In those days, you thought, oh, you missed the whole show. I was 26 when I got in, and at 26, you're immortal. By the time I got to Normandy, several villages had already been captured. We just set up a tent hospital. It was unbelievable. I was the admitting officer. We were on the highway to Cherbourg, which had just been captured. There were supposed to be several evac hospitals to pick up the wounded, but something went screwy that day. I had a tent full of wounded that had just been brought in by an ambulance. A sergeant came in and said, Captain, you better come out and take a look at this. I went out, and as far as the eye could see, for miles up the highway, there were ambulances waiting to get in. We had a 400-bed hospital, and we were already filled. Then he said, I want you to look out there, too. I looked around, and there, lying in the field, are several hundred wounded. I said, my God, what do we do? This is incredible. Somebody screwed up somewhere. So I said, Sergeant... Get me about 20 syringes and 20 shots of morphine, and we're going out for a walk. It was a bright, beautiful summer day. The two of us wandered from group to group. I had a vision in my mind of the Civil War, with all the wounded in the fields, in little groups, those Matthew Brady photographs, relived on this field. At the front, we were 12 hours on and 12 off. As a designated neurosurgeon, I had certain responsibilities, head wounds. Well, out here, from day one, there was one head wound after another. We finished one case, three or four were waiting. Nobody else would ever touch a head because in this territory, if you didn't know your stuff, stay away. So I had no help. There was a period of three, four weeks in Normandy where I was working day and night. 
He flips a page in his diary. I see that I fell asleep one day standing in the operating room. I'd been going about 36 hours continuously. What was a day like? It was a 36-hour day. Walter Rosenblum. In the pre-invasion bombardment, we killed a lot of French people. When our big planes went over and dropped these bombs, we wiped out half of Colville-sur-Mer, a little village near the coast. I made photographs of funerals and mass graves. The French people didn't say, what did you do? You killed us. They felt we were the liberators. They understood what was happening. It's one of the sad parts about the war. After the beach had been settled down, I was called back to the Normandy beachhead. It was Eisenhower's first visit with Bradley at the beach. All the generals came. I was the photographer to cover the event. It was very impressive. But it was funny, too. They were talking like a bunch of kids. Yeah, he's going to deserve another star for this. What about so-and-so? No, I don't think so. They were handing out decorations as though it was a party they were having. You were told which was their good side and which was their bad side, and you only photographed them from their good side. 